Tell us about Gary Frazier's study about the Adventist health studies. So, Gary Fraser, a wonderful investigator, blessed uh, with a community of people who are willing to submit highly accurate food frequency questionnaires and uh, admit what they're doing with their lifestyle. And that Adventist church has uh, been advocating for lifestyle improvement uh, for uh, the American population of it. And it has a fair amount of African Americans who have such a high burden of cardiovascular disease. They ask people to do an ovo-lacto-vegetarian diet. Um, that's including dairy and, and eggs. And uh, yet there are people who do a completely plant-based diet. People who, uh, you know, uh, dis decide that they're going to eat fish. There, there are people who eat a regular American diet and then people who sort of straddle the fence, so-called semi-vegetarian. So Dr. Fraser actually has five different groups that he can study and compare outcomes. And where do we start with the insights that he's developed? I would say uh, number one in my mind, uh, being a practitioner on, in inner city Chicago, is the dramatic effect that improving uh, along that spectrum of, of diet, m moving toward the plant-based diet, away from the animal, the standard American diet, can dramatically decrease the risk factors of the African American population. Not everybody knows it, but 48, 49% of all African Americans, essentially half of all African American adults, have some form of cardiovascular disease. It is largely related to lifestyle, diet, and exercise. And if we could just fix the diet aspect of it, Gary Fraser's data says you're going to see over a fairly short period of time dramatic improvement in weight, decrease in diabetes, improvement in cholesterol, improvement in hypertension. Long term, that should be lives. That's brains. That's functional ability to go to work every day. Uh, having that kind of improvement on our society and our community would be tremendous. So I really applaud um, Gary Fraser for pursuing all of this. Then he's got a lot more data, um, uh, such as, for example, if I just hit two or three highlights, it would be that if you compare those five diets, the only uh, one that doesn't have, uh, the only group that doesn't have a body mass index more than 25, meaning they're overweight on average, is the completely plant-based vegan diet. The incidence of diabetes, extremely low in that group. Incidence of uh, hypertension, very low. But, you know, those are just risk factors. How about heart events, heart attack, stroke, and death? So they are getting to the point where they have enough data to publish on um, mortality statistics, and they do show that particularly in men, you can get about a 30% reduction in cardiac events and mortality. Um, lastly, the, the picture that comes up now in my brain when, when uh, having talked to Gary, uh, and I wish I could just go back out there to Loma Linda and congratulate him again uh, in person just because uh, there is a, uh, you can actually find it on, on the internet, a publication that looks at the age incidence of each of those five diets. And you could see the standard American diet just decreasing over the decades, okay? And the plant-based diet increasing over the decades. And when you get to the, the 70 to 80 uh, decade, the two of them are almost the same. You would think that the, if you got to 80 and 90, they would be the same, based on the, the you know, sort of plotting out the, tr the trend. Uh, what does that really mean? It means that more people are going plant-based as they get older, and they're dying less. And that's why the two curves are going in completely different uh, directions. Tell us about the REGARD study showing the African-American diet is deadly. REGARDS is an incredible group of investigators um, who are really dedicated to reducing stroke and looking at all the risk factors for stroke so that they can be addressed. Um, and working on that uh, in 
starting off in the stroke belt of the United States and the South, they identified pretty early that there were dietary components. Um, and they actually also had sort of five diets that, you know, that were really sort of um, taking nutrition questionnaires and grouping them. And there wasn't, because this is general population uh, in the South, there wasn't a lot of plant-based diet, but they do have what they call a plant-based diet, which is actually a diet that just has more vegetables than the usual, okay? Um, then they have one, well, the person drinks a lot of alcohol. And, and, but the one that was the most damaging was the so-called Southern diet. That is a lot of organ meats, you know, and uh, putting fat back in your greens and not just yams, but candied yams. So there's a lot of sugar, a lot of sweet tea, fried foods. And if you do all of that, it increases your stroke rate by 30%. If you have kidney disease, it increases your cardiovascular death rate by 50%. Increases your uh, cardiovascular disease overall mortality by 56%. It's all about the diet. And so it was really good to have a data set that's that robust uh, because they're able to really um, hone in on what it is that we shouldn't be eating and hopefully everyone will take, take notice and, and, and stick with it. If you add up sort of the, the two uh, and looking at the African-American population, no question that we could pretty much eliminate the cardiovascular ethnic disparity in disease and death if we fix the diet. And yet, throughout the inner cities and so many other places, all is available is crap. It's interesting that um, the United States has uh, congressional money for uh, fast food industry essentially supporting sp specific products like high fructose corn syrup um, and production. Uh, and there are actually products, fast food products, snack products, that are made predominantly with federally subsidized uh, dollars. That makes them very inexpensive to sell, high profit margin. And they tend to be in the inner cities. And if you give you know, your typical inner city 14-year-old a choice between you know, uh, a dessert and you know, a sausage pizza versus fresh fruits and vegetables, they're always going to be picking the wrong things. They learn it from the parents, they learn it from the schools. Um, uh, we've had difficulty on the South Side that's be, been recognized and well talked about uh, in churches where there's a lot of uh, unhealthy food in churches and there's so many people who are addressing that now. We're addressing it at Rush University um, with uh, our prevention program and working with churches, many of whom have already started uh, trying to clean up what, what goes on. They say that uh, culture beats strategy all day, and that is a really good a example. That is, if we don't change the culture and be, have it be commonplace, then we're going to uh, continue to promulgate uh, unhealthy diet. <sighs> Hard to talk about that without talking about the origin. Uh, and for the African American population, the origin of what you eat, you learn it from your parents, you learn it from their parents, you learn it from their parents. You go back just a few generations, um, my maternal great-grandmother was born in slavery uh, in the South. And uh, the emancipation happened when she was about three or four years old. Um, but what was ingrained in her was basically slave food. And people have talked specifically about why don't we get rid of the slave food? Well, what is it? Well, it's the pieces of the animal that wasn't desired by the people who could afford uh, more. And so uh, anything that was going to be thrown out. Um, and so you see people eating small bowel called chitterlin, chitlins, chitlins, okay? Uh, well, that is not, not the kind of food. Um, that you would like to see people eating uh, very high fat, 
uh, content, a lot of saturated fat. But it was inexpensive. In fact, it was free because it was going to be thrown away. Then you switch to the, the, and you combine that with the federal subsidies that we have that make uh, you know, rapidly absorbed carbohydrates and fried food uh, less expensive, then the people who have any kind of economic depression are going to eat, uh, gravitate towards those foods. So one of the things that we could do uh, to break the cycle is education. And the other thing that we could do is stop the federal subsidies and uh, make those you know, dessert snack foods more expensive. That actually has been shown in terms of sweetened beverages, that if you tax them, it decreases their consumption. Many people think that that's unfair, that people should have a choice. Where do I? My own personal, I have respect for both sides. I was absolutely thrilled in Chicago when the law was passed saying that um, there would be more Cook County taxes on uh, sugar-sweetened beverages. Um, I was hoping not that we would collect more taxes, but that we'd have less people uh, drinking uh, those sorts of things because we know that that would decrease the incidence of diabetes. They had to pick out just one disease um, from recent literature, and I'm not sure that people voting were aware of the literature because it was relatively recent, uh, saying that if you do one sugar sweetened or, or uh, low calorie sweetened beverage, one per day, it increases your risk of diabetes by 20%. That's a big burden to put, and many people are doing much more than one per day. So we have a situation where um, we are feeding our population the kinds of food that are gonna make them ill we pay for the production of things that are going to make them ill and then worry on the other side, how are we gonna pay for health care? Well, a lot of it has to do with prevention. Let's, let's start at the beginning and incentivize people to eat and drink the things that are gonna keep them healthy uh, and save our Medicare system. So I, you know, I've said it publicly many times uh, in response to the Medicare trustees saying that the Medicare system is going to be uh, bankrupt in 2026, that it's everyone's patriotic duty to pay into the Medicare system and then don't use any of it. And how do you do that? Completely plant-based nutrition, exercise every day, make sure that all your risk factors are controlled or addressed and that you're not overweight. If you do that, we will save the Medicare system.